welcome ICPSR Summer Program Director Mike Traugott, Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan. Mike, please take it away. Thank you, Scott, uh, and also Shelley. I'm glad to be able to be here uh, during this webinar to talk about the summer program. And my plan is to give you a brief history of the program to explain to you how we got to be what we are and where we are today, to talk about the 2020 program just completed and then our planning for 2021. And uh, um, we've left a great deal of time, I hope, a sufficient time at the end to answer questions that you might have, uh, especially about forward planning for next summer. In order to begin, I want to uh, show you, now I have to find it. Um, I want to show you this uh, scrapbook. Let me go back here. It's, it's disappeared suddenly. Um, okay. Sorry about this. This is uh, a, an electronic scrapbook that we prepared from the summer session just completed. This was uh, work done by Shelley Petrinko.
we're <coughs> very Excuse proud me. of... I'm Mike Traugott, the director of the ICPSR summer program, and I'm pleased... This is how talented Mike is. He can be in two places at once. Glimpse from the scrapbook of uh, how proud we are of the summer program. We have a great staff, uh, small, but very devoted to their work. And of course we have an excellent set of instructors and uh, TAs who, who uh, work with them during, during the course of the summer. So I want to tell you a little bit about, as I said, uh, how we got here. Uh, um, the summer program uh, started in 1963, and uh, it, at the time, the organization which was just initiated was called the Inter-University Consortium for Political Research, ICPL, and that's because the first summer program is linked to a book uh, created, written at the University of Michigan by uh, Angus Campbell, Warren Miller, Don Stokes, Phil Converse, uh, called The American Voter, which was responsible for the start of the beginning of the political behavior movement in political science. And it was based upon a set of surveys that were the precursor of what we know now as the uh, American National Election Study. This is a photo from the archives of the summer program of the participants in the first four week session. Uh, you can see uh, Warren Miller uh, on the left in the front row. Um, you can see that the participants were uh, mostly male, um, uh, mostly white. There are, I think 58 in this photo. There were two four week sessions and they have recorded 60 participants at all, uh, in all. In the first curriculum, there was one course in the first session, the first four week session, which was research design taught by Gerald Gurin. And uh, in the second session, uh, Phil Converse taught uh, a course in quantitative methods in the analysis of political data. You, you can see how these were related to the design of those initial surveys. There were also two special seminars, one by, uh, led by Carl Deutsch and Herbert Hyman on comparative political research, and another taught by uh, Joseph Tannenbaum and Walter Murphy on research in public law and public behavior. So, over time, the curriculum moved from an emphasis on survey design and analysis. And actually, there is now uh, a summer institute in the Survey Research Center, which continues to focus on those issues, but obviously in a more uh, sophisticated way. Then the curriculum moved towards uh, looking at panel designs, collecting data over time and advanced statistical analysis. Um, now we have a program that uh, consists of courses on cutting edge analysis methods. We also have a curriculum in qualitative uh, research methods and a series of special topics courses. We have also added uh, le uh, lectures in uh, contemporary topics like coding, introductions to Python and R, and also issues of uh, data visualization. Many people know us as summer camp for stats. Uh, and that is 
a commentary on the current structure of the program, plus the experiences that people have coming to Ann Arbor primarily uh, for their instruction four or eight weeks in the summertime. So the curriculum consists of uh, short workshops, three to five days in length. Uh, they are ordinarily held at seven different locations across the United States with a couple in Europe. There are the two and four week courses uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, we have a series of short lecture series. I just made a reference to a couple of those, for example, the, the lecture in uh, Python. And then we have a series of Blaylock lectures, um, which are special topics held in the evening uh, in honor of Ted Blaylock, who was uh, an official representative of the consortium from the University of Washington and also served on the um, ICPSR Council. And um, the Blaylock lectures uh, are available on uh, the summer program's YouTube uh, channel, as this particular presentation will be. And at the very end, you'll see a link to uh, how to get to that kind of information. Let me turn now to talking about the 2020 program. Uh, up, up until uh, the beginning of March, the middle of March, we thought we were gonna have a regular structure and we were gonna be teaching in person in Ann Arbor. But of course, as all of you know, from your own experiences, the the pandemic uh, due to COVID-19 changed all of that. And we had to convert the entire summer program to online instruction. We, we were able to do that with, uh, as I said, the, the devoted effort of the staff. Um, and we did that by converting all of the participants and the instructors essentially to University of uh, Michigan, uh, either students or faculty with computing credentials. We used the program called Canvas to establish, uh, create a website for each course. And we use Zoom for the presentation of the, of the materials. Um, this was a challenging task because instead of people being assembled in Ann Arbor or in one of these remote locations for a few days, we had participants who were spread out all over the world, which meant also obviously that they were all in different time zones. So this was uh, a major uh, logistical feat uh, that our instructors had to deal with um, not only for their teaching, but also for things like office hours. This past summer, we had 32 courses. We offered 32 courses in the four week sessions. We had 12 separate lecture series. There were uh, 42 workshops, uh, short workshops um, that we also assume responsibility for because just as our campus closed down, so were campuses all across the country closing down. And uh, we were able to complete this program with the help of 98 instructors and 53 uh, teaching assistants that we were able to recruit and hire. So I wanna turn now to uh, how you could think about planning for um, attending next summer because we're, we're interested in having you join us. And um, I wanna show you something about the kinds of information that we provide ordinarily uh, on our website. This is the front page of the, of the website for the summer program. Um, and you can see that there are links here to the courses that we offer, the schedule of courses, and uh, also how to register. The information about the courses consists not only of the schedule, but there is a brief description of each and also a syllabus that's associated with uh, the last time it was offered, which in, which in uh, this particular case would be uh, for the 2020 program. Um, we, uh, you can go into the 
a, a curriculum section, the courses and scheduling section, and you'll see that the program is organized, first of all, by the four week sessions and separately for each, and then also by the three to five day uh, workshops. Again, with this information provided about course title, a brief description, and uh, a syllabus. And uh, again, I, I've provided the, the link at the bottom of the page uh, to this particular section of the website. I want to, uh, I want to mention that um, most of the participants in the program uh, have some support for their home institution, although not all do. And we have a pretty extensive scholarship program uh, to assist uh, participants, particularly with the uh, coverage of the fees uh, for registration in, the, in, in our curriculum. And in the past summer, we, we awarded or administered 108 scholarships. Um, some of these are endowed. You, you, this particular page from the scholarship page uh, on the summer program website focuses on the endowed scholarships. Um, some are supported by the ICPSR itself. Some are supported by uh, the ISR director's office, some by the graduate school at the University of Michigan. And we also uh, worked with a couple of grant programs this summer. This is the this past summer was the first time that we had a small cohort of uh, undergraduate women who were interested in uh, political methodology, thanks to a grant uh, to to two uh, co PIs from the National Science Foundation. We had uh, a, a, an award from the African Studies Center. Uh, at the University of Michigan to, to uh, support the participation of some sub-Saharan sub African uh, researchers who were interested in building their methodological skills. It's, it's difficult to talk about the curriculum because it is so extensive uh, and, um, and there are so many uh, offerings. The coverage is so great and there are so many offerings. But this is uh, a, a, an example of the courses that we offered in the first four-week session uh, this past summer. And I remind you that there were two four-week sessions with very little uh, duplication of the course offerings. Although in one session, sometimes we have an introductory course and in another session, we have uh, uh, an advanced course. Um, these are the main uh, four-week courses with a couple of the uh, lecture series uh, added in. Again, I remind you that if you go to the, to the website uh, for the uh, uh, summer program, um, you'll be able to find a, a complete listing of the course titles, brief descriptions, and the syllabi. I want to say uh, a couple of things about planning for 2021 because we are right, obviously, at the pivot point of wrapping up uh, our work from this past summer. We're, we're sending out uh, certificates of participation and finishing up grade letters. Um, and, and if you're interested, I can talk to you about what that what those two things are and, and uh, how they differ. Um, but we have to turn to planning for next summer uh, because there are a lot of decisions, important decisions that have to be made. Probably the most important is to decide upon the mode of instruction. Um, we learned a lot from our online program this uh, past summer and it has both advantages and some disadvantages for the participants, as well as uh, some structural issues for the, in, for the uh, instructors. Some people found it easier to participate remotely because uh, especially it was less expensive. 
they didn't have to pay to tra uh, travel to Ann Arbor or, or to rent a place to live, maybe even while they had to maintain a lease on a place uh, at home. On the other hand, working from home, as I'm sure many of you uh, understand from your experiences, was often complicated, either by um, interruptions that came from work or uh, if you have uh, young children at home, or if you have other people uh, whose uh, care and health you are responsible for. So um, we're, we're in the process of deciding uh, about the mode of instruction for next summer. A good deal of this is out of our control, as you will understand, in the sense that we have to make a, 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 a guess uh, about what the state of the pandemic will be through the spring and the summer, and also what the uh, status of the development of a vaccine would be that might permit us to have um, in-person instruction. I think it's likely that we will um, initiate our planning by thinking about a hybrid program in which we will try to have uh, in-person instruction, but allow people to come in remotely um, for the reasons that I described uh, a, a moment ago. And if it, if it turns out that uh, because of unfortunate circumstances with either the pandemic or with the development of a vaccine uh, and the campus is closed and we can't have in-person instruction, uh, we think that we're well in equipped and uh, experienced to carry on instruction remotely. We will also be doing a, um, a review of our offerings. Uh, we've already had some suggestions about courses that could be added. We'll take a look at enrollments. The offerings will look substantially like they did this summer, but there could be some changes uh, around the margin. And we'll also have to have a, uh, a conversation about fees. Um, registration typically begins uh, for a summer uh, session uh, in the first or second week of February. And we plan on maintaining that schedule. And uh, we will, be, we will uh, announce uh, sufficiently in advance by the end of the year uh, what our uh, schedule will be, what our curriculum will be, and, uh, and, and what the fees will be. Um, so we, are, we already have set the schedule for next summer because that's related partly to the University of Michigan academic calendar, uh, which has some consequences for us if we teach in person and we have to make arrangements for uh, space both for uh, the administrative home of the program as well as for classroom instruction. So we know that the program will, beginning, will be beginning next summer on June 21st. And uh, it'll, it'll go the first four week session until July 16th. The second four week session will uh, start on uh, the following Monday, July 19th and run to August 13th. The short workshops begin typically in early May. Uh, these are the th uh, three to five day workshops. Um, we'll have to do some thinking about the structure of uh, these offerings, depending upon the way we think about online instruction versus in-person instruction. But that will all be done on the same schedule and the short workshops, uh, they, they run all the way through May. So those were the main points that I wanted to cover. And I'm happy to uh, take your questions, but uh, I wanted to include this information in the slide deck, which is um, how to get to the summer program website. I've given you some examples of the kinds of information there. How to get to uh, the Blaylock lectures on YouTube. The summer program has a YouTube channel. All of the lectures uh, actually from the last several years are available on the channel. And the um, 
electronic scrapbook is uh, there as well. And of course, there's the summer program uh, email address, which you can use to contact us at any time to ask uh, any questions. And so with that, I have finished my comments, my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. And uh, Scott, is, Scott is going to moderate uh, the discussion. That's right. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott. I'm moderating. Um, I also work for the summer program. I'm the communications coordinator. Um, so we've got a question here about, uh, is there anything I should do now to prepare for the summer program next year? Well, it, I, I'm going to assume that the person who asked that question is a graduate student. And um, I would say that, the, that the, the best thing you could do in advance is to think about the curriculum and methods at your home institution, to have a, con a conversation with the faculty advisor or me mentor um, about uh, what is offered at your home institution and what is not offered. And then to look at the uh, ICPSR um, curriculum offerings to see how you could supplement your local offerings with courses that we have. If you are a more advanced graduate student and thinking about a dissertation project, for example, you, you may already have in mind a project, uh, a kind of data that you might be uh, interested in analyzing. And there could be a special topic uh, associated with analysis of those data. And uh, again, based upon a conversation with a mentor or a faculty advisor or dissertation chair, you could enroll for a special topics course. So I would, I would be planning about what courses I might take. I'd look at the schedule for their timing, what, when we make it available, and then I would plan accordingly. I'll say that one thing that, um, I'll add this comment. Um, in conversations that we had with students this past summer, most of which of course were held on Zoom uh, over lunch. We had, we had luncheon talks. Uh, some students asked about whether or not we could set up a mentoring system among prior participants, recent participants in the summer program. And we're gonna give that serious attention and try to figure out how we can implement that, uh, taking into account the decisions that we have to make about uh, mode of instruction. But we might be able to uh, provide help and guidance from uh, recent participants as well. Like at the beginning of that, you um, said that you assumed that a person was a grad student. Does that mean the summer program is only limited to grad students? This is another question we had. Can undergrads attend the program? Well, we have, we have uh, participants who are undergrads, grad students. We have faculty who come for uh, special topics learning or uh, retooling of their methodological skills. So uh, I, 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 I didn't mean to limit it in that uh, particular way. Um, we can take undergraduates. Uh, this past summer, as I mentioned, we had uh, some, uh, we had a cohort of uh, undergraduate participants. Um, we uh, are, are happy to have people come to the program, participate in the program uh, at any level uh, in their in their career. Um, if you're an undergraduate and thinking about coming, you probably ought to contact us uh, so that we could have a conversation about Ann Arbor, for example, if you've never been in Ann Arbor before, and about uh, graduate uh, instruction, because most of our instruction is at the graduate level. So we don't have special courses for undergraduates. We're happy to have undergraduates participate in the program, but we're happy to talk to you about these kinds of things. Um, is there a summer program alumni network? This person met a lot of incredible people here and they want to meet some more. 
Well, that's, you know, th that's uh, what something that we're um, thinking about developing in the next several months, uh, next few months, because we want this to be in place uh, so that it could be of assistance to applicants for the 2021 program. So we have been working with people at ISR to develop a newsletter. Uh, and and I, I think that we've just sent out the first issue of this newsletter to actually all the email addresses of people who have uh, participated in, uh, in the summer program since uh, 2008, I believe. But of course, if you're just thinking about the summer program, you wouldn't have received that. But if you send us an email, we'll make sure that you get a copy of it. And in this email, uh, there, there's a solicitation, for example, of people to be mentors, uh, which would be the beginning of this network. And so we can get you into the network electronically, and then we'll see what comes out of this solicitation and we'll, we'll try to match up uh, people with particular interests and those who have participated already in the program. Um, this person is wondering, uh, are there any scholarships that are particularly suited for a certain field like political science? Yes, in fact, there are. And um, the, uh, in particular, the funding that uh, the ICPSR makes available for scholarships is directed toward uh, particular disciplines or areas of research. So there's political science, uh, public policy, education uh, research, uh, and you'll find that on the scholarship uh, page of the summer program website. Um, this person, I think you just mentioned this uh, about the alumni network. If they were the beneficiary of a scholarship and they want to help others um, get to go like they did, can they adopt a student or can they fund a scholarship? Well, we certainly would be happy to receive uh, funding that could be devoted to scholarships because uh, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody made the calculation while I was making the presentation, but uh, about 10% of the people who participate in the summer program receive a scholarship. And, and we would like to increase that proportion. Uh, and, and we'll see what might be possible um, coming out of this development of the alumni network. Uh, right now, uh, I think we only would have the ability to collect uh, financial contributions that would go into a, a general kind of scholarship fund. We don't have an ability to link up uh, a donor with a specific participant. But um, as, as we work more in, in uh, this particular activity, we'll think about ways that we might be able to do that. Um, this one is I guess more related to if they were in person in Ann Arbor. Does the staff have favorite restaurants that they should know about if they come to Ann Arbor? <laughs> I'm sure that every staff member has their own favorite restaurants <laughs> that they go to. And uh, Ann Arbor has actually become over time a pretty good restaurant town. And uh, so there wouldn't be any shortage of suggestions about places to uh, have a luncheon or to go out to dinner or probably even to have a beer. We actually did um, a welcome video a couple of years ago uh, about like things to know when you come to Ann Arbor. And one of them was like the best restaurants in the city and each of the staff members said their favorites. I think we had Frida Petito's was there. Um, there's this place called Tianshu that serves really good like authentic Chinese food. Um, what else was there? A pizza place in town, uh, Blue Tractor, which is a barbecue place. Um, I should mention Frida Petito's does like these Cuban uh, burgers, 
Mike, do you have anything that sticks out? What do you like? Well, uh, I, I'm uh, partial sometimes. It depends. I'm par I, I like to go out for a walk at lunch. And uh, I'm partial to uh, German food. Um, I don't think... Uh, I don't think a visit to Ann Arbor would be complete unless you went to Blimpy Burgers and got uh, a dish full of disrespect, but... <laughs> yeah, I got yelled at while you make your order. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because you didn't order in the right sequence or use the right language, vocabulary, so... That's a, definitely an Ann Arbor experience. Um, so back to summer program business, when are scholarship applications usually due? We, um, we take the scholarship applications, I believe, uh, well, let me say, let, uh, this reminds me of one thing. The scholarships are primarily for the four-week sessions. So we can take uh, scholarship applications anytime from when a person registers up until, I believe, the beginning of April. Um, a, a, a typical scholarship application is going to require letters of recommendation. So um, you, not only will you have to register, you'll have to, you'll also have to make a contact with uh, faculty members, advisors, and so on. And um, we will uh, complete the review of the applications uh, by uh, the end of April so that you'll know uh, well in advance of the second week or so of June, whether you'll have financial support. Um, can you give some examples of classes that uh, you know will be running next year? Do we have any mainstays in the program schedule? Uh, yes, I mean, that's why I, I, I inserted that slide uh, in, the, in the PowerPoint. Um, which what which contained the offerings from uh, this past summer? Uh, so we be, we we offer courses in in uh, statistical analysis. You know, starting from uh, regression, uh, going on up to you know things like multi level models. We offer courses in. Uh, 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 measurement. Uh, scaling multidimensional analysis. Um, we have lecture series in, uh, that provide background uh, for statistics and data analysis. Um, Bayesian modeling is another very common uh, uh, offering in the curriculum. And increasingly, we have been uh, adding courses to the curriculum that uh, involve management and analysis of big data. So uh, that, that's just an illustration of the range of offerings. But again, um, I, would, I would suggest uh, going to the website uh, to look at um, the, the range of offerings. Um, how does someone apply to be a TA for the summer program? Well, uh, that's a real good question. We, we instituted a new system this past summer in which we advertise nationally for TAs, uh, which is a little different than the system I believe that's been used in the past. Um, and we do that uh, by posting uh, essentially on the University of Michigan uh, HR site. And so uh, we, you know, there's a sequence here, obviously. First of all, we have to get the curriculum straight and know what we're offering. And then we make an estimate about enrollment. And then we think about whether we're going to need TAs. So um, we wouldn't actually post for these positions probably until uh, March uh, or, or April. We were thrown off a little bit on this schedule by the uh, COVID pandemic uh, this spring, because when we realized that we had to go online, we had to figure out uh, which of our instructors would be able or wanted to teach online. 
And so we had a little tinkering at the margin with, uh, with the offerings. Um, but you can uh, keep an eye on the website. We make announcements like this, for example, that the TA positions are now uh, being advertised. You keep an eye on the summer program website and then you uh, respond uh, uh, accordingly. I guess also on the subject of hiring, someone wants to know where we usually find our instructors. Do they come from the same institution or different institutions? Well, I, I, I have to say that, um, you know, this, uh, although a long time ago, I was a, uh, a participant in the summer program and also a, a, an instructor in the summer program, uh, I, I came to my current position only in January and the, and the staff, the instructional staff was all hired. Um, and I, I'm not very familiar with how this was done in the past, although obviously we have uh, excellent instructional staff and we have a lot of repeat instructors. But part of our planning going forward to 2021 is to think about uh, how we'll go about hiring for that session and also to what extent we, uh, for example, add courses and might require new instructors. So again, when we make this decision, uh, which is not entirely internal, we have an education committee of the council that we consult with. Um, we'll post that information on the, on the summer program website. Then we have one last question about, um, this person wants to know if they can bring their own data to the summer program to work on. Um, you know, this is a kind of a, a complicated question in the following sense. Um, I think it's perfectly appropriate to do that, to, to carry data along, you know, on your laptop. You won't be able to introduce it in most classes, uh, but you will be able to consult with your instructor or your TA, for example, during office hours, or, you know, to have a general conversation uh, uh, about your interests and about your data and about, you know, what uh, appropriate analytical techniques to deal with your data might be. So um, I, I would say with those, uh, with, with those parameters in mind, I think it's a good thing to do. Well, that was all the questions we had. So before um, we formally end, I guess a couple of links I'd like to post. First off, if you do have any questions after uh, we end here. Maybe you've thought about some things and you want to ask us one. Uh, Shelly posted our email address in the chat there. I also am going to post our social media channels where you can follow us um, and send us messages through there. Um, and with that being said, I want to thank you all for coming and I want to thank you, Mike, for the presentation. Great. Glad to be here. And, and I, I hope that we get to see you in the audience next summer. Great. Thanks, everybody. I hope you uh, have a good rest of your day, and I hope you can join us for more data fair sessions tomorrow and Friday.